Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's educational series. I'm here with Logan Byrne, brilliant friend of mine who teaches at Yale Law School, who's going to talk to us today about Benedict Arnold, George Washington, the plot to overthrow America. Logan, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. So I thought that Benedict Arnold was a loyal soldier who fought all the way up to Montreal and was a trusted member of Washington. How did things go wrong? Right. So Washington thought so too. Um, so Benedict Arnold was a brilliant tactician. Um, in fact, the battle of Saratoga, arguably the turning point in the war that got France to come in and be our ally, which we desperately needed at the time, was in large part thanks to Arnold and his bravery. Um, Horatio Gates, his uh, commander at the time, wanted to retreat and Arnold said, no, attack, attack. And um, was he was the driving force for the victory at Saratoga. But as part of the fight, um, Arnold's horse was shot and fell and crushed Arnold's leg. Um, so after, in the aftermath of the, the Battle of Saratoga, Arnold changed. So he was always um, sort of a quarrelsome guy. So he, he was from New Haven, Connecticut, um, where I am right now. And he was, a, he was a merchant. He made a lot of money um, in the shipping industry. And, but he was always the guy that, um, there was a story about how he caught a Frenchman along, along with his sister and he shot at him. He had a lot of fights with his, the, his business partners. He was like kind of a quarrelsome guy. And when you bring that to the Revolutionary War and you're fighting with all, sort of all these patriots, of course, he's gonna, he fought with people there as well. Um, what didn't help was that he, he liked nice things. So he seemed a lot more like the, the British um, aristocracy that they were fighting against than he did as a sort of rough and tumble patriot, like the people fighting under him. So this meant things like after Saratoga, Gates took credit for winning. Um, everyone, not, people didn't really look to Arnold um, to give him the credit that he thought he deserved. Uh, further, as he was convalescing and healing his leg after the horse fell on it, um, he went back to Philadelphia. And while he's in Philadelphia, he started looking at all the debts he'd been running up because he was helping to finance the war. So he was paying for his, um, you know, to keep his, his unit, um, you know, clothed and fed and things like that. And he expected Congress to pay him back. Um, but as we all know, during the Revolutionary War, Congress had no money. So they had not paid him back. Um, so what he did being sort of an um, entrepreneurial guy he, used, he asked Washington to be the, um, the military governor of Philadelphia during the reconstruction of Philadelphia. So um, just to back up quickly, um, the British had invaded Philadelphia. Washington had attempted to hold them off. Washington had lost terribly. The British took over Philly and they were terrible. They um, burned houses. They used their houses for fuel. They, they took whatever they want. Um, they were pretty horrible to the town. But eventually they withdrew and Washington installed Arnold to help with the rebuilding effort. So Arnold comes in, he's hobbling on his crutches because his leg is still healing. He has not gotten the credit he, he deserved for Saratoga. He has now in, run up these heavy debts and Congress shows no sign of uh, paying him. So he turns to... Um, sort of profiteering on the side. So he's using um, military convoys to transport goods that, and then he's making money that way. He's asking people for um, payment for protection. Um, sounds like sort of thuggish stuff to do, um, but it was sort of pretty commonplace. Um, that's just sort of what happened during wars. Um, but sure enough, the, the governor, the, 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 the governor of the state of Pennsylvania, so he was the military governor of Philadelphia, and the, the governor of the state of Pennsylvania thought this was terrible. And so the governor of Pennsylvania and the executive council um, brought him up on corruption charges. And he was outraged um, again. And he went to Washington for help. And Washington felt bad and wanted to defend him. But the governor of Pennsylvania said to Washington, if you support Arnold on this, we will withdraw our troops and our, and our money from the war effort. So Washington was in a tight place. And so he kept silent. Again, Arnold feels betrayed by yet another person. Now, even in his mind, Washington's betraying him. So he's seeing all this betrayal. He sees that the war, we're losing the war left and right. 
um, you know, we went up Saratoga, but then, you know, for every battle we won, there are many others we lost. And he thinks, wait, we're going to lose. I, I've lost all my money. Um, I might as well come out on the winning side and make a buck doing it. Um, so I mean, this is where the plot of West Point comes in. Um, so have you visited West Point? It's a gorgeous, gorgeous part of New York. Yes. Right. It's a gorgeous spot. And then you know that sort of... Um, right on the Hudson the River. Right, with that, and there's that hook on the river where everyone takes those photos. It's sort of, you know, people get married, there's a lot of wedding photos there, or if you're just visiting, and there's that. So to us, obviously, it's a gorgeous spot that, you know, very picturesque. Um, to the, the, the Patriots, that hook in the river meant the British ships needed to tack and were very vulnerable in that spot. And you also know sort of it's um, the, the earth slopes down into the, to the river at that point. So we see all these things again, we see beauty. They saw, oh my goodness, if, if we have cannon on top, we could pelt the British ships as they're trying to tack around that bend. And this is sort of the perfect place for a land-based defense. Um, so I remember the United States has virtually no Navy of their own and they're fighting against the British who are the most powerful Navy on earth. And so they need this land-based defense and West Point is the perfect place for it. So Arnold, um, starts working with the British high command at this point. And um, there's all sorts of theories about how that happened. Most people would think that sort of, it was his new wife, uh, uh, Peggy Shepin, and her family was sort of known loyalists in Philadelphia. And they think that sort of as he was falling in love with her and he was sort was of- her brother a major in the British army? Or? I believe so, yes. Oh. Yes, so see, they, they were very much involved. Um, I don't remember if it was a brother or it was another relative, but, but yeah, there was definitely the, the, the fam family connections there. Um, and sure enough, um, you know, some theorized that was through her family that Washington, uh, that to me, Arnold got in contact with Clinton, um, who was uh, the British controlled New York City at this point. Uh, Washington had lost the Battle of New York pretty miserably um, back in 1776 um, and into 1777. And uh, so the British are in control of New York City. Clinton's there. Uh, Arnold starts working with Clinton to create this sort of dance. So the step one was for Arnold to get control of West Point, have Washington give him leadership there. And they, they at one point it was called Fort Arnold because this was, this was Arnold's fort. And so he works with the American troops and engineers and he gets all the plans for the fort and he starts drawing up uh, the plan for phase two. And the phase two was to have a sort of coordinated dance with the British where the British would attack and then Arnold and his troops would put up a defense, sort of a pretend defense. Uh, um, but then, Wash then Arnold would surrender very quickly and then he would escape and then ask Washington for control of another fort and then hopefully do it again. And um, in this, if we lost West Point, I can't I can't even express how crucial West Point was the war effort. Now, if you think of the map, so the Hudson River um, sort of you know connects New York City, which the British controlled, up to Canada, which the British controlled via the Hudson River. And if if the British could use their ships to control the Hudson, they've encircled New England, and New England was a hotbed of rebellion. That's where the, most of the the men and the the food and the um, and everything was coming from. And if they could encircle New England, they most likely win. They win the war. Um, Washington's cut off from, from most of the supplies and men, and, and that's it. So but if Arnold is able to do this with West Point, and then he's able to do it again with another crucial installation, forget it. It's definitely over. And you know, the, the British knew this. So they're willing to pay about, you know how it's difficult to sort of take $17 um, dollars in the 1770s or pounds in the 1770s and convert them to today. But the best estimates are about $25 million. So that was sort of what he was gonna get for the, the betrayal of West Point. Um, and, and sure enough, he, he, um, he, you know, he draws up the plan. They have the whole dance. They're, they're trying to coordinate the whole dance in which the British will invade and he'll surrender. But luckily he's working with, with two, two men. And, and this is really where a lot of my, um, my scholarship is focused because the way that, that these two men, the, way the scenario plays out with these two men says a lot about the presidency today. So it sounds sort of crazy. We're talking about commander in chief, George Washington and a traitor, 
in 17, uh, in 1770s, what could it possibly say about the presidency today? But, but actually, actually a lot. Um, so, um, so just to these two men to describe them. One is a man named John Andre. He's a, a British intelligence officer. He was a pretty um, lovable guy. Um, there's all sorts of. He was known more for his courtesy than cunning. He was um, a beloved character. He there's all stories about how he was only over in America is involved in the war because his fiance dumped him. His fam her family was very rich and he didn't have enough money. And so she dumped him and he was heartbroken and he fled for adventure and to get and hopefully riches um, as part of the war. Um, sure enough, he, he, you know, the British high command loved him. Um, they thought he was a good guy. And they, so they said, okay, we have this really important mission. We need you to, to liaise with uh, Arnold for this plan. But then as part of the plan, there's another man was um, named Joshua Het Smith. Now Smith was an American. So remember, Andre was a Brit, Smith was an American. And Smith was an American loyalist. Um, so like, you know, um, uh, Arnold's new in-laws, um, there are plenty of loyalists to be had. About 40% of the population at this point were loyalists. So if you think about that, that's a, uh, that's actually a pretty high estimate. I'd say more like 20 to 40 percent of the population were loyalists. But still, either way, that's a big, that's a big chunk of the population are actually against the cause. Um, and so Smith was one of these people who wanted the British to win, and some were more involved than others. Um, but what's really telling is how Washington treated these Americans, um, and it says a lot sort of for today. Um, so sure enough. Um, Smith and Andre get the plans from Arnold from West Point, and they're they're riding down um, through Westchester to New York City, and they're captured. Um, sure enough, uh, Washington captures Smith, and Smith is sort of a hated character. He's sort of um, you know you read his autobiography, and he still does not come out looking very good. And he wrote it himself. Um, sort of a, a social climbing type wants to you know with. Uh, on, uh, Arnold took him to good parties, um, so therefore he he was following him, and he thought that the, that's how he was going to win. Um, not really exactly a principled man, um, but sure enough, he Washington gets him and, and goes up to him and says, "I have enough evidence to hang you on yonder tree." Because remember, Washington, this plot was a shock to him. He's, this is a trusted, um, this trusted man. This is this is Arnold who had done great things in the past for him. Um, he was shocked. He was scared. He didn't know how far-reaching this plot was. Who else was involved? If you couldn't can trust Arnold, who else was involved? Um, were the British going to invade other areas? This sort of it was. He was terrified, and, and so he wants to get information out of, of Smith and says, "You know, I have enough evidence to hang on yonder tree." But what Washington does is really amazing. What he does is he provides Smith with, with due process. Um, and this is, this is the idea where he gives Smith a two week long trial. He um, provides him some rights. Um, I guess these are where the comparisons between King Arthur and uh, George Washington come because in Camelot, uh, King Arthur uh, provided for trials as opposed to you know, combat. Excellent point. I never thought that way, but I, I, I agree. Um, absolutely. So. Um, Washington, this was shocking. And people were, were, were pretty upset and sort of um, bewildered by Washington's actions. But what Washington said was, I'd rather that the history books show that I provide the rights to American citizens and I was not behaving like the King of England than to get the justice that this, this man deserves. And, and sure enough, the um, Smith argues he has a high burden of proof because as an American citizen, you need to show that he had the mental state that um, that he knew he was doing something wrong. And he argued that he was just following orders from an American military officer, which Arnold was an American military officer. And he says, oh, I didn't know I was doing something to betray my country. I thought this office, this American officer was telling me to do something and I was following orders, which is, I mean, you read, his, again, his autobiography and sort of, yeah, right. But sure enough, he gets off. Um, and, and then they actually bring him in on other charges and they have him in prison. <laughs> Danbury, Connecticut, and then he um, he gets he uh, ends up um, escaping. He dresses as a as a woman and escapes back to New York City and gets away. And as much as this is sort of this this caused outrage throughout the colonies that this this awful despicable person got away, um, 
for for Washington, he was looking at the the long game here, and that set a precedent that when it came to American citizens, the commander in chief of which Washington was the only American commander in chief that we ever had in the Constitution, he had a lot less power, and he had to respect the rights of American citizens themselves. Okay, but then what do you do with the other guy? Remember Andre? This is Andre is the lovable one who escaped because his fiance dumped him. Um, he they bring him into um, custody, and Hamilton loves the guy, thinks he's a nice young man, thinks he's smart, thinks he's interesting, he's a nice guy. Uh, too bad Washington has him hanged in two days. Um, he provides him with a military commission, and if you get in trouble with the military, you don't want the commission. That's the bad one. It's sort of um, historically speaking. Uh, a kangaroo court in which um, the commander in chief decides the rules and there's not, not necessarily any due process and it ends up being sort of you know, should you be shot or hanged kind of thing and poor andre will ask even just to be shot which is more admirable um more dignified way to die um but he didn't even get that he was hanged as a spy and and again this shows another the other side of the coin where um when they came to the, the american commander in chief he had a lot more authority and say and discretion when it came to foreign nationals. So faster, so I, I you know I teach at law school and what we do is we take this history and we use that as precedent um, to understand what are the powers of the presidency today. So um, when you're looking at the constitution, um, this is a whole idea of originalism, which um, you know, there's a lot of debates about how much weight to give history and things like that. But um, you know where we are today is you know the conservative, judges and justices tend to give it more weight, liberal judges and justices less weight, but everyone, you know, Justice Kagan famously said, we are all originalists now. So everyone uses this history as at least a very important starting point for constitutional interpretation. So what does this mean for today? This, this, this means that um, when it comes to, um, you know, the powers of the presidency, this, you know, if you read Article 2 of the Constitution, it doesn't say a whole lot. There aren't many words there. Um, but sure enough, the president derives a lot, all of his powers from those few words. And one of the most important phrases in Article 2 is that the president should be commander in chief of the Army and Navy. So my scholarship, and, and I argue that, the, that, that this was very obvious when they wrote it, what this meant. Um, they don't elaborate in the Constitution because they didn't have to, because it was what the guy, George Washington, who was standing in the front of the room when they wrote the Constitution, what he had just done. So this is sort of um, you know, everyone, all of America after the war loved Washington and almost universally approved of the way he handled things, um, especially things like this, when he was very, um, you know, King Arthur in a sense, like you said, um, when it came to American citizens, but then also fearsome in, when it came to protecting his these citizens from foreign nationals. And when they write that the president should be commander in chief, um, it makes perfect sense legally to look to what that the only American commander in chief we ever had, what he had done. Um, so often at times I, I look at issues of today and I take that history and say, okay, there's this real divide um, when it comes to the powers of the presidency when based on who, um, whom he's dealing with. So if he's dealing with a foreign national, then he has a lot more discretion, a lot more say. Um, and when it comes to American citizens, that's sort of the, the president's power as um, a lower ebb, um, where he has to defer to the you know the Americans' rights in the um, in Congress and other authorities. I love it. This was a fantastic conversation, Logan, and I, I really appreciate you coming on today. And uh, I hope everybody checks out Logan's book, Blood of Tyrants. Really fantastic read. And uh, we'll talk soon, Logan. Thank you. Good to see you. Absolute pleasure. Really wonderful conversation.